probably good. And, and anyway, it led to a... Uh, breathe out the jive. How did you go from despising astrology column, as you said in the, at the very, very beginning, to become the most celebrated astrologist in the world? <laughs> I think because I wasn't fully invested in being a famous astrologer, that had something to do with my success because although I love astrology, I think it's like any other belief system, it's something that you shouldn't take 100% seriously. You should always withhold at least 20% of your uh, fanatical investment in, in order to let it breathe and, and um, work as metaphor, not as literal fact. That's pretty much the approach I take with all the belief systems that I borrow from. and. With that approach toward astrology, I think I was able to bring more spaciousness to it, more humor, and um, because my ego wasn't so invested in becoming the greatest astrologer who ever lived, I was able to just appreciate astrology for itself and not for what it could make of me or what the, the, the fame or the uh, notoriety it could make for me. I didn't really care about that. To tell you the truth, in my earlier life, I wanted to be a rock star, and, and that's where my ego was invested, and that's where I, that's where I got caught in the ego trap. But as far as astrology, I didn't get caught in, in the ego trap, and I think that allowed me to fully embody a, a, a really spacious and uh, more philosophical approach to it. And that's just part of the story. I was very lucky to come along at a time when there were no astrology columns in the alternative media in America. I was the first, really. And uh, my timing was uh, impeccable, no thanks to any <laughs> brilliance on my part, but just because I was there at the right time. And, and uh, I think it, and my persistence really had something to do with it because I was willing to be poor for a very long time and get paid very little to write the astrology column for the one or two papers I started writing for. And it took many years before I began to gather other newspapers that wanted to publish my column. And I got to be a better writer along the way. I got to be a better human being along the way. I got married and I had a child that made me a far better communicator and, and person. And so through this persistence and luck and some of my own talent, the, the column that I started writing in 1978 by 1992 began to get some momentum. And I think by, it was actually during the Gulf War, strangely enough, the first Gulf War, when I went, really went crazy and ranted in my column about American imperialism in, in, in the most poetic way that I could, in a humorous way, I got this influx of new newspapers that, that wanted to syndicate me. And, that was really the, my big breakthrough point. I guess it was in the winter, spring of 91 that I moved from about seven or eight papers to 30 papers. And uh, then along the way over the years, again, through persistence and because I was becoming a better writer, I added more and more papers. And uh, uh, eventually, because I was the first and because I was someone who valued good writing as well as good astrology, um, I just outpaced the other, the competitors. But what was the reaction of, of, to your first column to, to your, uh, from your boss at uh, Good Times? How did he react? I mean, was he prepared to something like that? Well, it, the... I wasn't completely active. There were other astrologers writing astrology columns, but they were very local. And in, in my case, in 1978, there had been a previous astrologer at the Good Times at Santa yeah. Cruz. He'd written for yeah. a year, and he quit, because, and he called his boss, my boss, a capitalist pig, and, and said, I'm not going <laughs> to work for you anymore. And Jay Shore, the boss, advertised for me, and I wrote a column. And uh, he was very happy with what I wrote, because the uh, Grammar was good, the spelling was good, <laughs> and he didn't have to mark it up uh, with uh, proofreader's marks. He, that was one of his criterion for, for hiring an astrologer. 
and uh, and and so he was very positive. I was I was uh, I'm very deeply in gratitude to him. Uh, and then when you started to become more famous from seven to thirty two papers in nineteen ninety two. Um, what was the reaction of the classic astrologists, your colleagues? How were you uh, welcomed by, by them or they were hostile or what was the For reaction? For the most part, no, not welcome because most professional astrologers view horoscope columns in newspapers the same way that I did when I began, which is with disdain. So this is not a way to do real astrology, to, to write about someone's sun sign covering one twelfth of the population. That's ridiculous. That's an absurd use of astrology. And so in the beginning, especially most astrologers, although they gave me a grudging respect for my writing ability, in general, didn't like astrology columns. Um, over the years, that's changed because I, I think that I have carved out a different use of the astrology column than had been in place before. And uh, I, so I think there's a greater proportion of professional astrologers who like what I do and appreciate what I do now uh, than, there, than there was at the beginning. This is, according to me, a very interesting part. The one, one, when, when you say uh, looking at, at your colleagues, I mean, or at least the, your predecessor, uh, that the fact that they looked only the, the sun actually right. and the sun, and, and you cannot say anything by judging only one one planet and and uh, taking out of that the, the the destiny of many people right uh, you wh what what do you what do you look and uh, how do you, do you differ from the others well it's changed over a period of time it's evolved my my premise was that what I was doing was poetry, not literal or scientific uh, fact. And if, if I took it as an exercise of the imagination in which I, my job was not to tell people their literal future, but rather to open their imaginations up about the possibilities in their lives, that was my initial premise, and that gave me uh, the freedom to um, take off from astrological factors, but, but also um, uh, regard what I was doing as a, a weekly dose of poetry, as a change with the seasons, as, as, the, uh, as the political climate, as the cultural climate of the United States changed. As, as summer moved into fall and so I would, would take into consideration the position of the sun, the position of the moon, any major planetary aspects that were applying there and I would certainly have that as my basis uh, and also feel free, give myself permission to um, trust in the imagination to see uh, undercurrents, undertones which is the prophetic role of the poet, in my view, uh, to see deeper, to see beneath surface reality. And so I was really, from the beginning, blending the role of the astrologer with, with the role of the, the prophetic poet. I'm, I'm not saying that I did that well in the beginning, I, I, and I'm not saying that I'm great at it, but that's been my aspiration, that's been my intention. When you say that you're blending astrology and poets, and you said something very interesting about the antennae of the of the antennae of the race, of the race, right. you know? um, this means that uh, practically what you say for the Cancer, which is your sign and my sign, can be applied to any other signs, or there is certain base. Because I mean, I, I find everything you write very inspiring and very. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's exactly what what you what you say. It, it opens up your ima imagination, and so you cannot do anything but good to the one who, who reads them. So if, if that was the the aim, you definitely uh, got it. But there's something specific to 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 the sign because uh, 
for instance, I, I've, I've read the, 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 can, the, the cancer sign in, in the, your last book, mm -hmm. and I find many things that in, in which I don't know if it was a uh, placebo effect or whatever, or a suggestion, but I, I could see myself in some part of it. But then, uh, do you think that there are some tendency which are true for every sign, some uh, kind of base uh, traits which are common to some, some signs, or you don't believe that? I do believe that there are archetypal qualities for each sign. I do believe that, and, and that's a premise that I work on. But I, just to step back a bit, I depart from other, astrolog other astrologers who believe that astrology is a science. I don't believe astrology is science. I believe that astrology is an art. It's a, it's a work of magic in the in the hermetic sense of the word, not not in stage magic, but in the hermetic sense of the word. And a, as a result, there's always something about what I do that's a little beyond rational explanation. And and part of why what I do works is because I think I have a relationship with my audience that is uh, very symbiotic. There is a there is an interaction between me and my audience that's developed over the years and in a sense I think I am a, almost a creation of my audience in the sense that I read them, they read me, we read each other. Over the years I've become almost like a, a, a feedback, uh, I've become a, a, a product of the feedback that they give me both through their literal emails and snail mails and and phone messages, but also through the dream time. I, I'm with, I'm with my readers when I'm sleeping. <laughs> I'm getting messages from my readers because I believe there is that, that kind of communication that is both literal and physical and spoken, but there is this other kind of communication that takes place on, on astral levels, if you will. And so over a period of time, those people who read the cancer sun signs are basically telling me how I'm doing. Am I am I reading you correctly? They're telling me yes, no, change this, uh, fix this. Uh, this is what my life is right now. This understand this is over a period of now 30 years. So this is a very long time to be learning the nuances of what it, what it means for, to be a Cancer, or to be a Leo, or to be a Scorpio, and so part of what my knowledge, uh, part of what my, the, the source of my inspiration comes from my study of the archetypes of the science as has been laid down by traditional astrologers and some comes through this intimate interchange with the actual Scorpios and the actual Leos out there who, who are telling me how I'm doing and what they want and who they are. So yes, I, I do think that when I write it for cancer, it's for cancer. It's not for Scorpio. The Scorpio is welcome to read it, and, <laughs> and maybe they can get something out of it. But I give it in the spirit of this is for you, because okay. of cancer. This means also that uh, uh, every week you calculate the position of of, uh, of the planets vis-a-vis -vis of of the of the sign. Right. In this case, cancer. Right. So you 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 do. The, the job every 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 week that's and, right and you try to understand what's the influence of that those position uh, towards the design yes okay okay and there's a system that I use uh, uh -huh. the, the, there I, I use the house system so that for for instance for someone born under the sign of cancer the Sun is in the sixth house right now during this this particular time of the year and that's a particular area of, uh, of activity in a human life. It's, it, it relates to one's health. To uh, is, is where? The sun? The, the, sixth house, the sun is in the sixth house for, okay. for, can yeah. for cancers. Yeah. That tends to light up the, the areas of our lives known as work, as, as health, as uh, adjustments that need to be made, of, of, of uh, shifts that need to be uh, accomplished in response to something not going quite right or so course corrections um, 
and many other things, but that's the that's the basics of the sixth house. Okay. And that's that's part of the matrix that guides my meditations on okay. how to approach cancer right now in December. Okay. Um, you define your spirituality as the mix of Kabbalah, Sufi, Tantrism, a certain kind of Christianity. Practically, uh, it's a kind of uh, mix of many, many different things. Uh, practically, what do you mean by this mix? And do we really need a religion? Do we need a religion? A religion? Yeah, well, that's as you for mean. each person. Yeah. I, I, leave that up to each person um, I, I don't I feel like I'm not a religious person I'm a spiritual person I don't follow any traditional religion and I I don't it's fine if other people want to do that as long as they don't get in my stuff and tell me that I should think like them as long as they keep to themselves and practice what they want to practice and don't try to kill the world in order to convert that's fine with me uh, I personally don't want or don't need to go to a church and follow a, a given set of dogmas about that was created hundreds of years ago. On the other hand, I do find great value in the in the great teachers of, of the past, and uh, and and I think it's very important for me to uh, realize how little my ego is, and how how little my me as a person is, and how much there out there that has been created for, for me to learn about. And, and, and par part of what I'm really attracted to is the spiritual teachings of the world. And among the things that, that I said, Kabbalah, Tantrism, and, and I forgot feminism in a way, right. but then we will come back to that later, the relationship with women and your uh, approach. Uh, mm, what were the influences that influenced influenced you most? The Western people. Hermetic tradition. Okay. Which is, uh, a lot of people in the West don't know about the Western Medi uh, Hermetic tradition. In California, the, the Eastern spiritual approach is by far the most popular. When we've got this perfectly wonderful Hermetic tradition that goes back uh, millennia, uh, which is under the, under the, uh, the, the uh, organizational principle of Kabbalah, and under that is alchemy, astrology, tarot, and uh, and uh, uh, it, it's a whole system of thought and a, a philosophy that has been developed over hundreds of years. And, and there are particular schools that teach it. They're mostly they don't advertise in the same way that uh, that New Age schools do, but. I've been a member of uh, one in the in, in America since I was uh, 25, and I've been studying in that in that school for that that length of time. And, and the most famous uh, philosopher that came out of the Western Hermetic tradition, uh, unfortunately, was Aleister Crowley. But he and which one? Aleister Crowley. But but he, in my opinion, was uh, really a. a a pretty bad example of that of, of, of that philosophy. He was the most notorious practitioner that, that's come out of that, but most of the schools that teach the Hermetic wisdom uh, are very quiet and not, not about proselytizing and detracting converts. And it's, it's a form of Kabbalah that is not strictly Jewish, it's actually a Christian Kabbalah. And uh, so for, for me, there's no contradiction between being uh, very attracted to the, to the teachings of Jesus Christ and, and to the Kabbalah at the same time. You know, Jesus Christ was a feminist revolutionary who had no possessions and, and hung around with the, the rabble. And I don't care what anybody says, Mary Magdalene was his, his first disciple and his most famous disciple. And, that's unheard of for any man back then, and so he's always been a very important force in my life. Going to your relationship, your consideration of women, 
you you've been quoted as saying that you are a macho feminist right well what do you what do you mean by that well early on and also a, a lesbian male right <laughs> you, you read you read a lot <laughs> yeah. I've, well, I've done my <laughs> homework yeah. early on I saw that a lot of men who wanted to be feminists were were wimps they <laughs> They were trying to be feminists in the same way that women were, were feminists, and I didn't think that that was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to be a man who was a feminist. I wanted to uh, be fully embody my masculinity and also be an advocate f for feminism. And over the years, uh, I I've had a lot of experiments and explorations of, about what that meant. And, but to be a macho feminist means to advocate for feminism as a strong, <laughs> forceful male would, and, and not uh, not as a, a wimpy, passive male would do. Um, and, and, and I think it's... Uh, I'm, the original title for my book, The Televisionary Oracle, was A Feminist Man's Guide to Picking Up Women. Uh, in other words, there, there, the joke there is that to to be a feminist man is actually in, uh, potentially one of the best ways to attract women that you can that, that you can come up with. And I would meant it somewhat ironically, of course, and to mock myself for for my own pretensions because the, I do know men who actually put on their feminist airs in order to to get girls, um, but. But to me, it's a, it, it's a, it's also a spiritual uh, revolutionary act because I'm convinced that unless the the feminine rises to equal power with with the masculine, that the the, the human human civilization is probably going to end. And uh, I'm that's one of the reasons I'm such a staunch advocate of uh, not only political power for women, not only business power for women. I, don't, I mean, at, at this point, Norway has laws that mandate, I think, 40% females in, the, in their uh, parliament, and, uh, but also in the boardroom. That they have laws manda mandating, I, I don't know what the exact percentage is, but there has to be a given number, uh, proportion of women in the, in, in the corporate boardrooms. I, I'm all for that kind of thing, and, and a lot of countries are way ahead of the United States, and that, I think there's something like 12% women in Congress right now, and it's, it's even lower in the, in the corporate boardroom. In Italy, it's even worse than that. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Why so much stress on women? Do you think they are better uh, than men in which respect? I don't think they're better than men. <laughs> I, they just have something different to offer, and the way, what they have to offer has been repressed and has been uh, 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 denied. And one of the important things that they have to offer is the art of relationship. The special, and, and I don't want to overgeneralize, some women aren't like this, but what the, the feminine principle, the divine feminine principle is to relate, to create intimacy, to create contact and connection. I was just reading recently that um, somebody was describing autism as just uh, a little bit of an exaggeration of the masculine mind autism being an inability to relate socially and to and to connect with people and to s empathize with other people and to understand what other people are thinking and feeling and there because men do have that uh, that tendency to uh, uh, put relational skills way down the bottom that's part of the reason why we're in the mess that we're in and so no I don't think that relational skills are more important than uh, the individuating skills that, uh, that uh, the masculine has specialized in. But we need them to be balanced. We need them to have equal uh, power and, and appreciation. Apart from William Blake that you quote extensively, uh, what are the thinkers that uh, influenced you most? Carl Jung is one of the most important thinkers, I think, of the, of the 20th century. He's all over my thinking. Um, 
he single-handedly recovered alchemy from from uh, its misunderstanding. It, it, alchemy was thought to be uh, the uh, the work to convert lead into gold and the and literal lead into literal gold. But the real alchemists, which uh, which Jung discovered, were about turning metaphorical lead into metaphorical gold, but through the transformation of one's own inner darkness. And I think Jung, Jung's work showed me how important it was for me to confront my share of the world's darkness, my share of the world's evil, and to see how it lived in me. And I think that's one of the most important messages I had to give people, is that it's wonderful to attack evil in the world, but in order to earn the right to do that, you have to deal with the evil, the darkness, the immaturity, the unrightness in yourself. And uh, studying Jung helped me to understand that. Um, Rudolf Steiner is an, another important philosopher uh, for me. Um, I would put him in the Western Hermetic tradition. There are a number of uh, Western Hermetic thinkers that probably, for most people, are unknown. Paul Foster Case is one of my teachers, and not many people have even heard of him. Dion Fortune is another one. Paul, For Paul Foster Casey? Paul Foster Case, C-A-N-C-E, you know. And Ann Davies, who is his successor, uh, also a Western Hermetic uh, teacher. Um, Patti Smith was a great influence on me. Um, <laughs> The, the, the person who showed me that uh, um, that it was possible to bring the Dionysian spirit into art in, in a way that was craft well crafted was uh, also had an intellectual in, in, uh, an intellectual component that wasn't just sheer uh, chaotic drunkenness but that had a, a <laughs> a crafted edge to it and uh, sh she was my mentor not literally I didn't study with her but she was my mentor in, in teaching me that which was a, has been an important part of my life um, on the contrary you don't have a very uh, at least with uh, you don't have a very good uh, um, attitude vis-a-vis -vis of uh, journalist uh, uh, writers and film directors that can be very dangerous prophet you you say because they they uh, put too much stress on on bad news is that correct well yes but especially if in their invocation of violence and misery and destruction they offer no redemption they offer no redemptive vision and that's that's a, a a a big problem i think i i and, and of course there are individual artists and film makers and musicians who paint a very dark picture of the world that i respect and i like but it's the sheer numbers of them, the, the 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 grotesque grotesquely large proportion of artists who are given to that invocation of darkness without any urge for redemption. That, that is so disappointing to me and, and uh, um, difficult for me to, to deal with. Uh, so the difference, according to you, is between the one you respect and the one you respect less is the fact that there is a chance of redemption and no chance of redemption at all? That would be one, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. For instance, uh, Martin Scorsese, like The Departed. Have you seen it? I haven't seen that. Uh, or anyway, in Martin Scorsese's movies, this this clash between good and evil is very often present, and it's uh, it's not the, the the good part that, that always uh, win. But still, I mean, it's uh, it's powerful in describing this clash. They're great artists, and yeah. a lot of these people who yeah. who create these visions, and that's what is so dangerous about them is and, uh, any one of them by themselves I can't I can't find fault with them they're doing what they're they came to do in this moment of history but it's a sheer number of them 
that add up to this uh, this flood of black magic that that, uh, that, that overwhelms the, the mass audience. And so, yeah, I could see Scorsese is man. He's a great artist. He, uh, uh, and, and from that point of view, I can appreciate it. But the the numbers of artists who there's there's a musician named Soup John Stevens. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's mm -hmm. pretty much my favorite musician. He uh, I don't know if you know that song, uh, Casimir Pulaski, birthday, or Casimir Pulaski Day, and it's a song about uh, a young man who has a flirtation with a woman who's dying of bone cancer. There's utter I mean, that's a desolate vision, uh, of, and, and he. He paints it so effectively. He's a wonderful artist, but there is some glimmer of of light in the vision that he presents. Some, if not, I wouldn't say it was hope, but but some opening that he 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 makes in that darkness that that makes you you, you just gasp with oh, there's something more here. It's not just death and destruction. And there's nothing else. There's some other breath present here that that we can know about. It's mysterious. He, he's not naming it specifically, but but it gives us mo gives us this moment of, of of loving life at the same time that we're being told this desolate vision of this girl dying. Uh, yeah, because going back to the, the previous question, I mean, these uh, dangerous prophets. Uh, and the bad news versus good news. Uh, you are a terribly well-read person and a very smart one. So, don't you think that it's a little bit? I'm trying to def defend in a way my category here, but right. uh, it's a, it it risks to be a little n naive to not to talk about uh, the the bad news because I mean it's, it's true that it seems that newspaper. I mean, as the English says uh, if it bleeds it leads right. so it's it's a general rule and very cynical rule of journalism to emphasize bad news because as you know right. they they sell better I mean I mean th this is true and and newspaper mostly they newspaper I mean they really stress that much but it's also true as you said before uh, regarding Jung that uh, you have to confront your shadow in right. a way. I mean, and the shadow is also a collective shadow because uh, I mean, there are wars, terrible wars. There are tomorrow. I'm leaving for for El Paso, Texas, and then I will do, I go to Ciudad Juarez, oh. and I'm not very happy to go there. To be completely honest with you, oh my God. but I have to go there. And so I mean, and really incredibly bad things happening in Juarez. I mean, people are decapitated and right. stuff like that. So right. this is a part of the reality. It's not that if I I will write an article about you, which is very right. inspiring, but then I will I will write also an article about Juarez, right. which I, I mean, uh, me as a human being, I would love that Juarez does, don't exist, but it does exist. Right. So my, my duty as a reporter is, is to, to, I mean, uh, in a way, transmit your message of hope and of self betterment, but then I, I also have to give the other. Don't, don't you think that? I mean, we risk to be naive by saying that uh, we should emphasize the good news. That's not what I say. Yeah, yeah, okay. In my, yeah, in my yeah. piece, Evil is Boring, I say yeah. all I ask for is a proportion. I would say I would accept 20% of the news to be uplifting and redemptive and, and hope inspiring. That's all I ask. I, I want, I, I, I've been, I've been a, a, a left-wing revolutionary since I was a yippie in, in my teens. I, Abby Hoffman was my, was my mentor back then and I'm still that way. I'm still a yippie. And, and I'm, I'm absolutely, totally opposed to the American military machine. I'm totally opposed to the war in Afghanistan. I've been totally opposed to the war in Iraq and, and the more and the WikiLeaks, I'm all for them, all, all for the revelations. I think that that transparency that's coming out is just wonderful. And I, I want that stuff reported. All I want, in addition, 
and, and I'll say it is 20% if we could get 30% of the airwaves 20% of the of the news newspapers pages um, and it's not it's it's about it's maybe 3% at this point and, and and I don't think that's unreasonable it's not a call for uh, repression I think I, I think uh, recently Russia and government actually began to uh, require that the, the newspapers publish uh, a certain percentage of good news and I'm not I'm, I'm, I'm more in the libertarian socialist end of things so I'm not about that but I want I want this to be self-enforced I, I want people to question their own motivation and someone like you I think that's beautiful you're you're going to talk with Rob Resney and then you're going to Juarez and that's that's all I can ask is for someone who is willing to to cover both those polarities. <laughs> and going back to the influences, uh, you already quoted uh, Sufian St and John Stevens. Uh, who are some other people, contemporary people, who you like in, in the arts? I mean, be them writers, musicians, directors, people you you like and you find inspiring and I mean, Leonard Cohen is one of the great artists of our time I'm convinced he's a deeply spiritual person he even spent I think six years in a monastery very devout Buddhist and yet that doesn't result in some sort of uh, party line Buddhist set of lyrics he's absolutely an artist he's he's just cutting away the, the 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 story the the cover stories that were told and getting to the getting to the roots getting to what's beneath our, our lives and uh, I am I'm a great admirer of, of his work he's a he's a poet who's a musician he's a spiritual poet a spiritual musician who's speaking to a lot of different people he's not just ghettoized in some little corner speaking to a, preaching to the choir uh, I'm a tremendous admirer of him. I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't see that many films because uh, films are, are uh, there are so few films that I'm aware of that um, that present a vision of the world that I'm interested in. So hmm. I, I, don't, I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm a, uh, I, don't, I don't have any favorite filmmakers. Do you watch TV? I do. I, I watch. Uh, I watch. Um, what do I watch? I just watch a couple different science fiction shows, basically, you know, huh. American science fiction shows. No late night show stuff like that. Huh? No. And literature-wise, literature uh, fiction-wise, who are your favorite uh, authors, writers? Fiction, fiction writers? Yeah. Right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't enjoyed Don DeLillo's books, the last couple ones, but he, he was a big influence on me. Uh, I didn't like them either, the last ones. Yeah, mm -hmm. but his earlier books are very important to me. Yes. Sam and Rushdie's, um, books were I haven't read his last two but he, he was very important to me um, I'm not reading a lot of fiction these days uh, I, I like to read poetry um, uh, and I there's a my daughter goes to uh, college and studies writing and there's a there's a poet named Joseph Lees who's uh, who was one of her teachers and is really interesting to me um, I, I love Galway Cannell's poetry. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Galway Cannell. Once you've done, at least I've read, you've done, you went to the highway and gave away money. Uh, several times I did that. Yeah, yeah. several times. Right. Are you, are you aware that this is something that one of the character of uh, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, God bless you, Mr. Was Water does? No, I didn't know that. Huh. 
Because what I, was the book? Uh, um, God bless you, Miss, Mr. Rosswater. I think uh -huh. is, the is the title. Yeah. I've read several yeah. Vonnegut's books. Yeah, because I had this impression that you could be a fan of Kurt Vonnegut. I, I do like. I, I am, but yeah, but, uh, I love Vonnegut's books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the the, the 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 main character of that book, which is a great book, and I strongly advise you to read it, is a millionaire actually. Uh -huh. He's the son of a family of millionaire, maybe billionaire, but he is completely crazy, according to his father at least, who, who spent all of his life to make this this fortune, and the, in the setup, a kind of foundation to give away all the of the wealth of his father that he wants to kill him or. And we made him declare completely full because he doesn't want his empire to be thrown away. But the guy asked the, the core of this actually one room foundation. They say, how may I help you? And he gives away the money, uh -huh. all of his money. And I said that I uh, found some resemblance with, with the things you've done. Um, why did you do it anyway several times to go and give away money? Well, it was partly for my own curiosity to see how people would respond because, um, as you may know, a lot of people have problems with generosity, receiving generosity, and that's what I found in my experiments was that um, a majority of people were very suspicious of the, the offer that I was making. They thought, and probably rightfully so, because often when somebody reaches out to give you something, there is a, a, there are strings attached. They want to sell you something or they want to rope you in to get you to get interested in their product. And so I understood that, but uh, I, I, was, I was really intrigued to find out that the poorer a person was, the more inclined they were to be suspicious of, of the gift. And that the wealthy people who would stop uh, wouldn't have any problems of the people in the Mercedes that would stop and roll down their window and I would get I would hold out somebody they would take it and they would is there any more <laughs> <coughs> and the poor people would would maybe uh, I, I, there were a couple people who slowly drove by me wouldn't stop they got back on the highway later and came back again to the same exit ramp and just just to see if I was still there um, so it was it was more for my curiosity to see how, how people responded, and I, I did want to create a kind of icon of uh, of pure generosity. I, I wanted to to offer that as part of the archetype that I aspired to to embody. Generosity without any strings attached. I'm not going to ask of anything from you in return. You don't have to buy anything from me. You don't have to believe what I want you to believe. This is just me serving as a, as a channel from the universe, showering you with blessings. I, I wanted to literally embody that and, and make it a part of my yeah persona, but also how that felt. This goes back in a way to original Christianity. I mean, give something without asking yes. anything back. Yes. Even if you you said that uh, you don't read a lot of fiction recently, your columns are literally filled with quotation, very interesting and very idiosyncratic quotation. Uh, how do you manage to read so much? What do you read uh, now? What are you reading? I mean, what is your uh, reading diet? Because I mean, you can find almost everything inside. Of, I mean, from poets to uh, some art science facts or w really whatever or a, a women in Indonesia that made uh, enlarge the penis of the person who contacted her so, I mean, what was that one? there was a lady in Indonesia who was uh, Abel Mac Erot something like that oh, oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean very very the, the, the most different things you can think of I mean how do you get to know those those things? What do you read? What is your well? I've been doing it for reading years. Diet. I, I've been reading for years, uh, and there was this point in my twenties. I decided that I was going to be 
a poet. It was going to be a, a spiritual aspirant, and I wasn't going to work. I was not going to work for a living. That's what I decided. I, I, I wanted the time to read, and I wanted the time to absorb culture. And I was extremely poor for 20 years, and I followed that path. And so during that time, I read Anais Din and, and, and read scientific articles on embryology and, and read the New York Times and read the National Enquirer and, and that habit has stayed with me. I'm an omnivorous uh, collector of, of, of all possible uh, input coming from the universe because I regard anything as potentially my teacher. Some maybe, some sources are perhaps more reliable than other sources. It's more likely that I'm going to find accurate factual information in the New York Times than in the weekly world news. <laughs> but at any one time, it's, it's unpredictable who is going to offer something that is interesting and useful to me. And, and so my main intention has been to be curious, is to cultivate my curiosity and to be ready to be surprised and of course, after all these years of having gone to the library and bought books, now I have the internet where the, the entire library of everything humanities that are written is a minute away at the most. And so I, I, I don't think it's, it's a pretty easy skill to develop to be able to tune in to a lot of different places. That's something that any any writer I think does nowadays. And uh, so I'm just continuing what I did before the internet, but it's a little faster now. Hmm. So I mean, how is like your typical day, from when you wake up to when you <laughs> do interviews so late? <laughs> what? Well, I my life goes through different phases. Yeah. So uh, what what I'm doing now is a necessarily what I do all the time. I, I really like that restless uh, spirit. And I was a performer for, for many years, uh, first in rock music and then as a performance artist. And uh, I've done well over a thousand performances. That's not what I'm doing right now. I'm living a, a more hermetic lifestyle. But um, my, 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 uh, mode tends to be to combine uh, structured activity, structured study, research, um, with uh, the, 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 the principle of, of the wandering around, whether that's wandering around the internet, wandering around in downtown San Francisco, wandering uh, out on the uh, out on the creek a mile away and, and seeing what the animals have to say or the trees have to say. And so each day might be different, each, each week might be different, I might be, be in a different mode here and there, but I, I really uh, try to apply in a practical way that, that principle of gathering, of gathering what, what is there to learn today. I love to learn, that's, that's just one of the most pleasurable things that uh, that I can imagine it's it's there's a sexual there's an erotic quality to it for me and furthermore it's since I've been doing this job over the years there's often what what the added thing is when a particular learning has some application that I can tell people about or or, or create art from create write, writing from or music from so there's this there's this uh, curiosity, this desire to learn that's combined with, oh, this would be great to tell Scorpio this week. And so there's a double thrill there. There's, a, there's the learn thing and just what it means to me and how it excites me and the excitement of how can I craft this into an inspiration that will contribute to the liberation of the Sagittarius person for December 9th. And, uh, and so that can take form of just sitting in front of my computer or, or talking with friends. I, I mean, my friends are used to me having a little notebook and, and scribbling things about what they're saying and, and, and getting ideas from what they recount to me. 
or just being alone and, and wandering out in the world. You, you don't have a typical list of newspaper or websites that you check every day? I, I, yeah, but, but I try to vary it too, so I don't get too mm -hmm. stuck in my ways. I try to, um, I mean, I, for a long time I stopped going to the Drudge Report because it, it just offends me, but I have started going back there again because I think it's important for me to know how the people I don't agree with think as well as the people I agree with. And, and so the whole point for me is to keep blowing open my mind, to keep, keep it from getting into a rut and, and uh, keep introducing myself to um, some, some new twist. I mean, how did I end up on the page where they were selling bacon, bacon uh, car fresheners? You know, they bake the bacon aroma car pressures. I don't know how I got there. It's a, it might have been through Reddit.com or something like that, one of those news aggregate sites. I, I do like to go to this news aggregate site, Metafilter and uh, FARC and uh, Reddit and Dig. And those are uh, miscellaneous uh, things. Um, I enjoy going to conspiracy sites. Um, that always. That, that always tickles me and, and, and amuses me. And, uh, and I certainly, I check out the New York Times on a regular basis. I go to CNN. Um, I love the science reporting in New York Times. It's just so fabulous. And it's, I mean, Natalie Angier, I don't know if you're familiar with her science writing in the New York Times. I, she's, she just whacks me every time. And, and, She's the one, he, she did an extensive study of the Bonobo uh, apes. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with them? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, I mean, one of the apes that uh, deals with conflict through arrows rather than, than violence and conflict. You know, mm -hmm. they, they, anyway, I love, I love Natalie Angier and, and the science reporting of the New York Times. And that's a place where I, I go on a regular basis as an example. And, and you, once you stumble upon a phrase, a quote that can apply to some sign or which has got a particular existential uh, meaning to you, you took notes and, and then you use it afterwards. Often, often I'll, when the quote strikes me or the fact strikes me, I'll almost immediately have in mind where it belongs. They often go together. Not always. Sometimes. Uh, like I, I was just, uh, last week I was going over notes that I made a year ago that didn't mean anything to me <laughs> at the time. Uh, but I, I save all those notes. I have notes going back to 1994. <laughs> and and uh, I, I can't remember specifically what it was, but there's something that didn't, that just, I had a blank about, but I still wrote it down, suddenly caught fire for me a year later. And... Uh, um, so it, 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 sometimes it has to go through a gestation period. <laughs> but again, for me, it's a, it's a magical collaboration with my audience that transcends my ability to explain rationally. And so <laughs> I'm not sure how the process works. There's some, there's some magic in there that uh, is working beyond my capacity to understand it. Since you've you've stressed this point a couple of times, uh -huh. the collaboration with your with the audience, how does it work? I mean, you have got a, a, a very um, popular website, and people can can write you. Uh, wh what is your policy? How do you, I mean? I imagine you 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 would be flooded by email. Right. Uh, yeah. How how do you be a how, how do you choose which one to respond? Bond. I don't respond to that many. <coughs> I yeah. respond to a fairly small pro yeah, proportion. To be possible. But yeah. they all, I read them all. I read every single one of them. <laughs> and uh, I, I was just, this past week, I was quoting a story that had been told me by a, a Scorpio guy who had responded to something that I, I had written, uh, I had quoted a Neruda poem. 
about wandering uh, wandering in the wilderness and finding a well that, and I can't remember the exact Neruda mm -hmm. quote, but this yeah. guy on Facebook responded to the quote that I gave and he said, I was in the wilderness once and I found a well and uh, I found a bucket that had a hole in it. And I, re and I was able to throw the bucket down and I got a half a bucket of water, which was just what I needed. Probably if the bucket didn't have a hole in it, it would have been stolen and it wouldn't be there. And so it was great that it had a hole in it. So anyway, this is a message from a reader that I quoted in my Scorpio horoscope. And, and some, sometimes it's not quite as literal, literal. Sometimes a reader will give me an idea that I'll take and run with. But in this case, it was I quoted this literal uh, uh, Facebook entry. <laughs> so just to finish that thought, the, yeah. the Capricorn woman had written to me and said that her boyfriend was very thoughtful about bringing her flowers, but they were the ugliest flowers imaginable. And uh, what should she do? So I quoted her letter and I, I gave a response, and that was the Capricorn horoscope for that week. Uh, at the very beginning, you said you wanted to be, that you accepted the gig as a, as a columnist for the good times because uh, um, it was a way to, to get paid to be a poet in disguise. Right. Um, how poetry can come handy in everyday life, according to you? So, ask the question again. Okay. How okay. poetry can 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 be useful in uh, in everyday life? For me, poetry is about a precise use of language, and that's a lost art in America, anyway. And if I can contribute to uh, people understanding that the language that they choose to render their experience actually help shape that experience if I can if I can give that to them that's I'm, I'm committing poetry if you will I'm, I'm, I'm giving them poetry therapy and then the other aspect of the poetic gift that I aspire to give is to to exercise their imaginations to show them that imagination isn't just something that uh, is prone to imagining terrible things and fearful things, but that imagination is something that you can play with, that can be the source of your creativity, that can uh, help you uh, bring new influences into your life, that, uh, that if you stay in your literal mind is impossible to do. So the gift of precise language, the gift of the liberated imagination. I think those are, are two potential gifts uh, that poetry has to offer that I, that I aspire to give. This imagination part is very important in what you, in what you say. I mean, um, you say also that uh, um, what happened to people is what they believe will happen to them. Word lives on the fuel of self-fulfilling prophecies. Can you can you speculate a little bit more about about this? It's a charged subject because it had that idea has been co-opted and literalized by the New Age movement in America, turned into simplistic formulas. Uh, as exemplified in the movie The Secret and the way that the, the, the simplistic portrayal is that all you have to do is imagine something and it will come true and I, it's much more complicated than that and uh, it, it really is something that is the basis of the Western Hermetic tradition and there are volumes and volumes and volumes speaking about the power of the imagination, but with all these subtleties, all this instruction on, on the proper use of the imagination, because the imagination is also potentially, as Gurdjieff said, a great enemy. It, it interferes with our ability to see reality as it is. It, it 
throws up all sorts of fantasies that are untrue and fears that interfere with us being able to perceive what's really in front of us. So there is that, that negative side of, of imagination. And furthermore, if, if what you imagine is not accompanied by uh, ethical behavior and a sense of integrity and also uh, the emotional power that must go with the imagination, then it doesn't matter how clearly you imagine the Mercedes Benz that you, that you want to uh, have materialize in your life by March. And, and so, it's, as I said, it's a charged subject. It's, it's a loaded question. And so I always hesitate to speak about it glibly. I don't want to speak about it glibly. Uh, it's not something that can be easily formalized. And I've, I've spent the last 30 years trying to master the proper use of the imagination. I'm not there yet. I, I, I'm still working on it. Um, but I, I do know this, that uh, that that's one of my main tasks in this life is the proper use of the imagination. And I suspect that it's pretty important for most other people too. If I can serve as, as a, a force in the world to help people see that and if I can help build their power to use the imagination to liberate, as a liberating force, then I, I, I'm pretty happy. So no, it's not as simple as I'm, I want to have uh, a dream home in the mount, on the mountainside in Maui, and, I'm, <laughs> and it happens. No, that it's, it's a lot more complex than that. However, it is important what you hold in your imagination. That, that does, it does have attractive power. If you're constantly living in fear, that tends to be the kinds of experiences that you attract to you, that, that feed your fear. If, you, if, you, if your imagination predominates with generous thoughts, with thoughts of caring for other people, that tends to be the kinds of experiences that come in your life. In fact, I've, I've read myself the book, The Secret, because I wanted to understand what was behind the kind of planetary success because right. it's uh, it's huge I mean also in right. Italy that has been <coughs> all over the world and and um, I've stumbled in, in, in these rules of attraction but I had really some hard time because uh, it seems like that the way they put it is that, that if you really think about money you can have money if you right. think about that girl no matter how good looking she is or not you will have a and unfortunately, unfortunately, life doesn't doesn't go That's like right. that. I mean, there is a, at least a dark side of <laughs> imagination itself, or at least there are some some limits. There are some limits. And, yeah. and how, how do you move yourself? I mean, uh, because it seems that all the time you walk on this very uh, risky line, the blurring line between uh, being so full of uh, of good uh, uh, books, good, uh, very, let me put it this way, um, it's like you walk on, on, on the thin line between new age and serious stuff, and you manage to stay on the serious stuff, but it's always like if you are on a tightrope, and how do you manage to, 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 to stay on the good side of this? Uh, because well, some people would say I don't. And some, <laughs> I, I get people all the time telling me, uh, dismissing me as another New Age <laughs> teacher. Uh, to me, the New Age is, has become almost like a slur. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a pejorative term. It's like calling an Irish person a mick. <laughs> and... Uh, I think that's unfortunate. Uh, it, it, and generally, what when someone invokes the term "new age," it means somebody that uh, has a very low uh, uh, level of discernment, uh, who's gullible in believing all sorts of uh, lunatic ideas, and uh, it just doesn't think very deeply. That tends to be an outsider's view of what it means to be new. Age. Of course, I don't want to <laughs> want to be in that category. 
However, the new age is informed by a deeper well of wisdom that wasn't invented in the 20th century that goes back millennia, and that's exactly what the Western Hermetic tradition is. I consider myself a practitioner of the Western Hermetic tradition, not a new ager. Uh, for most people, that dis the distinction is lost because they don't know what the Western Hermetic tradition is. But uh, uh, the, the, uh, if there are some resemblances, just as for me, the, the, the resemblance between the Christian church as it exists among the evangelicals today and the teachings of Jesus Christ, there is some connection, but and, and there is some connection between New Age philosophy and the the, Hermet, the Western Hermetic tradition. That that's important and valid, but uh, I I hope that I that I stay on the side of having intellectual integrity because my emphasis is on the teachings of the Western Hermetic tradition, not specifically on New Age teachings. And just, just to clarify a little, one of the main principles of the Western Hermetic tradition is that having a strong intellectual uh, uh, foundation is crucial to doing spiritual work. It's, it's in, intuition is something that comes after you've done the research, you've studied the facts to the best of your ability, you've, th you've thought with discrimination, you've tried to maintain your objectivity and, and, and uh, shed your personal biases, you, you've questioned your own emotional involvement. It's at that point that you have the right to seek intuitive understanding or, or spiritual uh, experiences. And if you don't have that foundation, then it's likely that your so-called spiritual experiences are going to be filled with delusion and, uh, and fantasy. So I think that's the ultimate answer to your question, is as a practitioner of the Western Hermetic tradition, I value, for lack of a better word, scientific, empirical ways of, of knowing things. That, that, that's, a, an important, that's an important approach for me. What are your critics, if we may say so, or your differences between the rules of attraction that, uh, for instance, uh, the secret uh, posits? Because, uh, again, when you were, what is saying uh, that people, life is what they believe they, they will be, I mean, what this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy thing. Uh, what is the limit, according to you, to, to this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, it's much more complicated than that. Yeah. Um, just to, to use as an example, yeah. if, if I visualize an hour a day that I'm going to be a concert piano player in three years, but I don't have much musical ability and I don't practice, it, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and furthermore, I would say that if I don't have uh, if, if I don't cultivate a strong ethical approach to my dealings with other people, it's not going to happen. The universe doesn't work to reward me surely because I have some greedy fantasy. It rewards me possibly, maybe, if I play the piano six hours a day for five years and if I was lucky enough to have my mother and father pass on to me a, a musical ability. Um, I, I listened to all the great piano music of the world and, it, and studied the way other people have played it. And, and uh, furthermore, that I aspire to make my piano playing, the gift that I've been given, a gift for other people. Those would be some of the, just some of the considerations that would have to go into this, the, the secrets formula working for me. It's, it's much tougher than, than, than the secret. <laughs> well, and, and I, what bugs me, and, and I think what bugs 
people that criticize the New Age is, is that it just seems so materialistic and so greedy, and, and uh, that does bug me. It's it's to me the the universe is a mysterious place, and uh, just because you want something doesn't mean you're going to get it. And it's it's uh, the universe does. As, as the, the book says, the, the universe showers us with blessings, but those blessings aren't necessarily what uh, the, the people in the secret call blessings. It might be a really difficult health challenge. That might be an incredible blessing in someone's life. Uh, uh, it might be, say in my case, being poor for 20 years. That was an incredible blessing because it, it uh, it ensured that when I did begin to uh, make a, a little bit more money, that I was going to maintain my my left wing revolutionary ideals. And so, in that case, for me, being poor for twenty years was a was a great blessing. So, the blessings that come our way aren't necessarily uh, what what the secret would say. <laughs> or that William Volman, I don't know if you know that that writer. Uh, he's one of my favorite writers, William Volman, V O L L. Oh yes, he's great. Uh, yes, he's great. Puts himself in. Uh, he would go to Juarez for uh, <laughs> two months. He would move in yes. with a prostitute. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And uh, he's great. Yes. Uh, anyway, he says the most, the thing that makes him happy, the thing that's, in, in essence, what's blessing for him, <coughs> is to do the most difficult task he could imagine. <laughs> and there, there's that other quote um, from the, the sculptor um, Henry Moore, Henry Moore which, <laughs> which I, I love. <laughs> it, the, the important thing is to do something every day with all your might. And the most important thing is it's not something you could ever accomplish entirely. Okay, no, it's very clear the, the distinction between you and the secret. Okay. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Good, I wish I could explain that to <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, some other question then get done um, because otherwise I mean the others don't you think that they risk to create a delusional world and they don't, they don't, they don't I mean because in a way this can be this can be uh, a critic which can be done also to you to 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 foster a, a too optimistic view in your in your readers because in a way it seems you give up to everyone, or you foster the the um, the hope in, in, in every one of your reader. And, and you once you explain that that if you are even if this is a, a kind of manipulation, but it is, it is a manipulation for good because it's a optimist manipulation. Well, balancing all yeah. of the uh, the toxin. I'm, in a sense, I'm medicine, and yes, I do sometimes go too far in emphasizing the redemption that's possible, and I'd go too far in um, suggesting to people that they can liberate their imaginations and have the, their imaginations be a potent tool. I, I go too far in that direction, but I guess my the way that I excuse that is that people are getting the exact opposite message all over all over the place all the time, and my little contribution uh, is is just a little tiny drop of medicine <laughs> compared to the toxins they're taking in. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, Yeah, because this was crossing another question, which is, you have already half replied to that, but this was more specific about pronoia. Uh, don't you think that, to say that the world conspire for our own good is a little bit too much? Or or do you think that's no, I a realistic proposition? I do, but it's, it's not that the world conspires in our ego's behalf. It doesn't necessarily conspire to 
give us a $10 million house and the most beautiful mate and the fame that we imagine we want. That's, that's not what the universe, that's not the goodness that the universe is conspiring to give us. It's, it's conspiring to give us the goodness that will make our souls thrive. And I, I use those terms ego and soul in very, fairly specific ways and uh, it, it's an important distinction. So, um, I, I, and I, everything for me is a hypothesis, it's not a belief. I, I know that sounds crazy from an astrologer, but I, I do propose that the universe is in fact a friendly place. It's, it is here, I, I'm, I, uh, subscribe to the anthropomorphic principle, the, which is a scientific idea that the universe actually was created for, for people. That it, it is the perfect place. That everything, everything about, the, uh, about the, the way that the universe is set up is designed to, uh, to create human beings, at, at least in this solar system. Uh, for example, the sun is just the right distance from the Earth, so it doesn't fry us, it doesn't doesn't freeze us, and it's not that it that the universe is conspiring for me to be a famous astrologer. The universe is conspiring to give me the experiences that um, educate my soul and uh, teach me. Uh, what it means to love in an intelligent way, uh, to communicate uh, it, with other people in a way that helps to liberate them and inspire them. That's what the universe is conspiring to do in my particular case. The universe isn't conspiring to make me live forever or, or uh, make me happy every day of my life or give me all the money that I need. That's, that's not the kind of conspiracy that I'm talking about, but it is here to give me exactly what my soul needs. And I feel that's true. That's my hypothesis about the way the universe works in relation to, to everyone else. And that's a, that's a big picture, and, and, you're, and you would justly say, and anyone would justly say, well, what about, uh, what about the, the baby in, in Sudan who watches his mother raped and killed? In front of them, you know, how, what possible way could you construe that to to be uh, a blessing for for his soul? And in the and I, I I'm not going to answer that in some facile, glib way because it's a long conversation. But I will say that in the the Western Hermetic tradition, which has been the the philosophy that I've studied, there is the the um, concept of, of reincarnation and, and that our our time on earth is a very long time that any individual soul is here many 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 times and so the suffering that I might experience in any one particular lifetime yes is actually uh, valuable in the long run for the particular uh, thread of evolution that we are following. You're taking the long run, yeah. Very long run, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of lifetimes. <laughs> um, Even if uh, John Maynard Keynes used to remind us that in the long run we'll all be dead. Without what? <laughs> John, John Maynard Keynes, right. the economist, used to joke about the fact that uh, in the long, when, when someone was proposing long run proposition to, to fix the economy, he used to say, in the long run, we'll all, we'll all be dead. Well, we'll all be dead many times, that's what I would say. We'll be dead over and over again, and we'll be alive again and again. When I was, when I was uh, 20 years old, a psychic told me, it was actually a, a collaborative experience, the, uh, meditation that, that I was uh, in one of my past lifetimes I was uh, a retarded uh, boy who died when he was 17 uh, but but there was uh, some purpose in that contributing to my life now 
uh, for among other things, it it uh, grew my ability to empathize, so that even though I came into this particular life relatively privileged, I have this background of, of having suffered a lot in, the, in a fairly recent lifetime. And I don't know if that's literally true, but I, I do think it's metaphorically true, and in the long run that, that some of my lifetimes have, have uh, provoked in me an ability to empathize with the suffering of others. And one of the answers that I give to the, to the example of the Sudanese boy is, is that um, the outrage that those of us in the West feel about that boy and his experience raises the power of our empathy, raises the power of our compassion, um, motivates us to ensure that this kind of thing won't happen again. I think you have the, the Italian version of Pronoia doesn't include that I, of course it doesn't I, I wrote a revised and expanded version of Pronoia that came out last year which with a greatly expanded essay of, uh, of glory in the highest and among other things in that essay I talked about how the whole movement uh, among Westerners to work in behalf of those less fortunate than them is a relatively new movement in the history of the world. It, in America, it really originated with uh, the anti-slavery movement in the, in the 1830s and 1840s. Um, but, and this has increased uh, tremendously in the last century and a half. The, the whole notion of, of countries giving money to other countries, as in the Marshall Plan and, and a lot of international organizations, this is unprecedented in world history. This hasn't happened before. And as Paul Hawken uh, describes in his book, uh, Blessed Unrest, he, he talks about uh, there is a, a revolution happening uh, in the sheer number of people who are committed to bringing social justice, environmental uh, improvement, and um, Economic equality, economic equality to the world. There is, there are over a million organizations worldwide, growing all the time, devoted to this. Now, this is unheard of in the world history, and this is only in the last century that something like this has happened. And so, when I say I'm not, I'm not just talking out my ass when I say that the the, the Sudanese boy becomes a symbol that motivates a hundred or a thousand Westerners to put their money where their mouth is, to, to contribute to international aid organizations, to, um, to do the politi political work that's necessary to ensure that kind of stuff isn't going to happen in the future. And I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, the report that came out of the University of uh, British Columbia in 19, uh, in uh, 2006, uh, the what's it called, the Human Security Report, and they did an extensive study of trends in the world since the uh, end of the Cold War, and contrary to what is generally believed, uh, the amount of war, acts of genocide, arms sales, coup d'etats have dramatically decreased. Uh, since uh, 1991, 92, and by every, pretty much every measure uh, of violence and conflict in the world uh, has gone down since that time in a rather dramatic way. To me, that should be, that certainly should be one of the, that, that part of that 20% of the good news that, that makes it over the airwaves. What are, according to you, the, the, the worst threats to society and the best resources. I mean, in a way, you have already replied that, but uh, apart for, for, from the dangerous prophets, other threats to society that you see very actual and very dangerous, what, what are they? Well, it's a great question. I think to put some context in it, we're all together in this, and there's uh, peace in 
my pro Doyen book in which I say, I talk about the seemingly evil people in the world. And I compare it to uh, a story by Borges, the Argentinian writer, in which he talks about how Judas was actually the uh, the more the more important player in that drama. Uh, Jesus got all the glory. Yeah, he suffered, but he got all the glory forever and ever. Where Judas had to play the part of the betrayer. Uh, he he volunteered. He chose to play that because somebody had to play it in order for the tale to to uh, be played out in, in the way that it had to, complete with the resurrection and the redemption. And and so, in a sense, Judas was just as important as Jesus was in that story. And uh, so all the evil ones, uh, this, and I put evil in quotes, they are part of the, the story that we as a human race are, are acting out, living out. And uh, so on a personal level, I feel emotional revulsion against evangelical Christians and, uh, and other fundamentalists who appear to be holding back the uh, development of a more just society, a more tolerant society, more uh, open society. But from another point of view, we could say that uh, pregnancy takes nine months. If the child is born after five months, it, it's not a healthy child. The evangelical Christians are making sure that evolution doesn't happen too fast. They're making sure that the pregnancy lasts nine months. So those evil people are, in a sense, conspiring with us to create the, the larger story, which is, which is this unfolding toward greater liberation, greater openness, more love, um, so with that as the context, um, I, and I, as I sink into my, my emotional biases, I would say fundamentalists are, are the, the greatest enemy of, of society, even though they may be necessary for me, they're the most difficult to endure. And by fundamentalist, I mean anyone whether it's a religious fundamentalist or, or anyone else who believes my belief system is the only belief system that's true and yours is wrong. Everyone else's is wrong. The way that I see the world is the only right way to see the world. And there are lots of fundamentalists, not just the religious ones. Yes, this is a very important point. C can you explain in a simpler way to me, I mean, why they are useful in a way, the, 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 the metaphor you've done of uh, generating nine months, five they months. They slow things down. Yeah, they slow things down. Okay. They, they keep things from <coughs> happening too fast. The ripening has to take place over a period of time. That's not necessarily um, accessible to my conscious ego. I think it was... Uh, there's, I quote some story about Henry Kissinger talking to uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, many years ago and, and um, somehow the subject of the French Revolution came up and, and Kissinger said, well, what do you think about the French Revolution? And Chiang Kai-shek, it's too early to tell. <laughs> we, we don't know yet. And in the, in the in the 2004 election in the, in the United States, a magazine called uh, What is Enlightenment interviewed a number of religious figures about, and posed this question. Some say this is the most important election in American history, George Bush versus John Kerry, uh, that if, if Bush is elected again, this will be the end of America. And all but one of the religious leaders said, yes, this is the most important election in American history and yes it's crucial that George Bush not be elected and the one who did say that was a Zen, uh, a Zen monk and I can't remember his name but he said we don't know We're, this is just human beings are dust in this long-term evolution that and for any of us to pretend that we know 
uh, what the turning point is, or who's evil and, and, and who's not, is presumptuous and arrogant. And I, I tend to I tend to lean more in that direction. Um, although at the same time, it, it, this is t- <coughs> this is the key this is the key paradox that I think is is crucial for me to hold, which is that everything's perfect just the way it is. It's unfolding just the way it is. I'm getting everything that I need, as is everybody else, and everything's completely fucked up. And I'm going to work with all my passion to increase the levels of equality and justice and, and uh, liberation in the world. And to me, to have both of those points of view and to live in the midst of them, that's where I live. Yeah, because uh, while you were talking, an example came to mind to me, a kind of rebu- uh, rebuttal of your point of view about the fundamentalists, they can, they can slow things down, they can be helpful in a way, and then it came to mind to me the guy, the researcher here in the US who stopped the research, uh, the funding of stem cell research because according to him it was against uh, right. and he, he went to the Supreme Court and now one single guy, I'll call him a fundamentalist, stop the, the reversa that the Obama administration was doing vis-a-vis of the stem cell who was our probably only hope against Alzheimer, uh, right. Parkinson and so on and so forth. So in a way I've I have hard time to see in that particular case how these fundamentalists are helping to ripen things better or to better think better think about uh, uh, the consequences of uh, many different. Well, things. I'm, I'm with you on that on the individual issues too. And, <coughs> and uh, um, the today, I think it was by some, the uh, Harry Reid in Nevada, the senator from Nevada, tried to. Uh, get through the uh, don't ask, don't tell repeal, and it failed by three votes. And to me, that's a, that's a tragedy. You know, that that there, it's, it's just, there are the people that are, are uh, trying to prevent gay people from, from having equal rights are on the wrong side of history. It's, it's going to happen sooner or later, just as blacks and whites could get married in America when they couldn't, and it, that was regarded as a travesty 40 years ago. We're going to look back 40 years from now and say, what, what were those people thinking that gay people couldn't be married? That's absurd. So, temperamentally, I'm with you. And, and, and I also need to keep open that bigger picture, which is that even though I'm going to try as hard as I can to enact, the, to carry out the world I believe in, I also have to have humility in the face that there are forces bigger than me and, and evolutionary trends that surpass my ability to understand. What some advices for a better living? You seem very apt to it, and uh, <laughs> you you have you have talked. I've, I've, I've read you talking about meditation, for instance. I mean, how to exceed the fourth dimension without using drugs and uh, me- meditation is an, is an important part of your life do you suggest it to I mean, or do you have a- any other practical advice on uh, how to um, b- better your life and how to increase your imagination any practical advice would be very much welcome well, it's difficult to give uh, <laughs> a few words of, of practical advice. And I, I don't know about it in Italy, but the people in America are just besieged by advice from experts about how to live better lives. And um, I hesitate to, to, to join their ranks. Um, something, but, something you do to better your life. I mean, or... But what I do to better my life, and I think that this works... Uh, for anybody who wants to try it, is to ask every day how I can love better, how I can love more. And not in a sentimental way, not just feel some warm, fuzzy feeling in in one's body, but what specifically can I do to to express uh, 
a, a greater capacity for love, whether it's the people in my personal life, the people whose lives I touch for, through my writing or for, through my music. I think there's always room to grow that. There's always something you can do that you're not doing. It's, and so that, that would be the first rule. And what goes along with that is to continually ask, what am I ignorant about? What am I missing? What am I stupid about? What unconscious behavior am I engaging in? And how is my shadow, my own inner ignorance and unrightness, how is that affecting my life and what can I do to uh, uncover what that ignorance is and maybe reshape it so that it's not hurting me, not darkening my life and the lives of other people. I think that's another question you can really ask pretty much every day and come up with a, a new insight. And, and for me, one of the best ways to do that is through observing one's dreams and uh, tuning into to my dreams and because that's a constant fountain of, of information about what's going on in, in the unconscious. People that I'm, I'm very lucky. I have I have uh, the luxury of uh, not working at a nine to five job and uh, being able to spend my time pretty much how I choose to. And for people who are working two jobs or have four kids, uh, it's not always uh, a luxury that they have to question every day how they can address their own darkness, but you can always ask, how can I love better? How can I love more? That's something anybody can do because that's something you can do in action. It's not something you do just in meditation. It's something you do in relation to other people, the people at work, your children, your parents. It's, it's a very practical uh, opportunity, again and again presented to you, to uh, open your heart, empathize more, express greater compassion. Okay. Do you meditate yourself? I do. Uh, which kind, may I ask? Well... Transcendental meditation or... Uh, no, I, I, there are various meditation exercises in the, in the Western Hermetic tradition. That, that, I mean, there are many different kinds. Uh, um, as an example, uh, there is uh, there is something called the the uh, the banishing ritual in in which uh, you the the magician or the the spiritual aspirant uh, uh, will imagine uh, the uh, uh, a pentagram of light in the four directions and invoke the presence of the highest God form that you can imagine. And there are prayers that go with this or that, that sometimes I will use and sometimes I'll improvise on depending on my mood. And it's a, it's a way to purify oneself of any inner uh, tendencies that might resonate with evil or lack of integrity in the world around me. So it's a, it's, it's a purifying ritual. And that, that's just an example of one meditation that I would do. If I'm working on a particular goal in my life, I might uh, visualize the, the, uh, the per particular details of that goal, the, the, you know, the concrete uh, specific details of what that uh, would entail, of what, what that outcome would, would be. But that always leads to the question of, well, is that, is that something that I have the right to ask for? Do I have the ethical integrity to ask for it? Is there anything I need to raise up in myself that would earn me the right, if perhaps I don't have the right? Um, how does this affect other people? So for me, meditation may be 
a conversation between me and the goddess or the, the angelic forces, but it always entails some practical application of my life in the world with other people. So I did, those are two. The, the banishing ritual would, would be a purification ritual. The visualization <coughs> would be a specific uh, picturing of a, of a particular goal. Uh, uh, there'd be, I mean, there are a number of other things that, that involve uh, meditating on one's own death. is something that I'll do now and then. Uh, meditation on uh, my on uh, my own past, Re uh, once a year I tend to uh, revisit, I try to see my entire life, try to revisit all the memories in my life that are, that I can imagine. Um, and as, as you might I imagine, the, the Western mystery tradition, which has been going for so many centuries, has any number of meditations that, that are available that uh, may be more useful to me or more useful to you. By the way, also, also Leonard Cohen was uh, has done a lot of meditation. And he has done that branch of meditation that also David Lynch does, and uh -huh. he's a huge testimony. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, last two question. Um, Judging from the position of the planets, uh, is there any anything in general that you can say about 2011? What will? Yeah, there is be? something. I, I think uh, there's a bit of very diff very interesting uh, configuration of planets that began this past year and is going to culminate in uh, April and May of 2011, and that is uh, uh, Jupiter conjunct. Uh, uh, Uranus in Aries and uh, there'll be other planets in Aries at the same time for part of that phase and uh, I see this as a tremendously uh, interesting potential to uh, reinvent ourselves and uh, it, it's it, it's a uh, it's an aspect that could be could be shocking. It could bring in um, information or revelations uh, that are completely unexpected. I tend to think that this WikiLeaks phenomena is is a, a manifestation of this aspect. It's a revelation of of, uh, of many secrets that have long been kept uh, hidden. Uh, in general, the entire uh, practice of diplomacy has been filled with secrets from time immemorial. Now, for the first time, because of the internet and, and because of uh, th this greater availability of, of information, the, the underside of diplomacy is, is being exposed. So I, I think that this is one example of the kind of, of revelation, the kind of developments that could take place. And another one that it, I, I speculate on is uh, the, the possible revelation of, of uh, by government by world governments that uh, that the contact with non-human intelligence has been uh, has been uh, happening for perhaps hundreds of years, uh, and well, we call it the UFO phenomenon. I'm not necessarily willing to call it people from other planets. I don't know what it is. I call it non-human intelligence. But I think it's that that's one other possible kind of thing from out of nowhere, just that completely changes the whole conversation about what human life is about. I think that that's another uh, possible thing that could happen. I don't know if you've been, you probably don't follow this stuff, but... Yes, but uh, I've read something about that some agency, U.S. agency, on the which was uh, dedicated to the search for non-human intelligence kind of recently. I don't remember exactly, but it doesn't strike me so much. Well, there's a, a number of generals <coughs> and military people in the United States just came out about six weeks ago with a revelation that over the last 40 years, um, UFOs or unidentified flying objects have been very concerned with 
uh, nuclear facilities around the world that have, have actually uh, manipulated nuclear facilities uh, in, in not only the United States but elsewhere. And these, this, is, this was military people in the United States. Uh, anyway, that was one example of many revelations lately that may tend to indicate there's some new revelation that's going to happen in that sphere. But I think, in, in general, the, the bigger picture is that whatever could be happening could come out of nowhere, just be you know, something that science fiction people can't even predict. And, uh, and I think in, in the long run it'll be exhilarating, it'll be, it'll be transformative in mostly the best kind of ways, but it could also be shocking. May we say that uh, you were wrong vis-à-vis -vis of uh, President Obama, or do you still think that he's got a very good astrological juju? Ah. <laughs> I mean, you were very optimistic about this, um, this astrological uh, outcome, but I mean, did the you guy, read the, the did guy you read my interview with uh, uh, with the San Francisco Chronicle? In which yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, <coughs> I mean, the guy is having some problems right now. Definitely. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know in the long run. I, I think it's too early to tell. I think in the short run, he still remains a, a tremendously uh, important um, archetypal figure for a, a, a black intellectual to be elected president, no matter what he does in the in the first two years and what he does in the next two years is to me one of the most revolutionary things that's ever happened in, the, in American history and I, I that will never we can ne never lose that that's something that's that changed history for good and it uh, it remains to be seen to me he squandered a lot of his uh, capital that a lot of the political capital he had um, he has disappointed me as he has a lot of uh, progressive people, um, and and uh, he hasn't he hasn't been the progressive president that we hoped. I don't think that I this is uh, uh, maybe I'm massaging my own memories, but I don't think that I necessarily believed he was a savior that was going to bring progress progressive uh, vision into you know, the the American. Mainstream. I, I don't think that I thought that. I hoped that, but I didn't necessarily expect that. Um, and and so, um, if I did say that, if I did say in that interview, and I don't don't remember specifically what it, but I I thought that he would have. And what I'm remembering, I thought that he would have some ability to avoid economic disaster. That's I think what I remember. I said and. I'm not sure that's still not ahead of us, that economic disaster, but so far he has kept America from sinking into a second Great Depression. So there, there's that. No, you're not messaging your memory. You said it's something which was very true also in that occasion. This kind of spiritual twist that, that he ever, that he puts in everything he does, and I, right. I definitely agree with that. I mean, however the outcome will be, if, if, we, if, we, if he won't be re-elected uh, yeah. next uh, time, but uh, I think that the change is for forever. I mean, it's something that was well, unbelievable, and, and the, the, the dose of ideality, idealism that he puts in everything he does, I, mean, I think, at least us. according to me, it's... Uh, out of uh, uh, beyond uh, beyond this belief. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he he may lose the next election because of his attempts to reach out and serve as a conciliatory person. That might and it looks absurd to us now, especially to the people on the left who don't want him to appease the Republicans. But from a certain point of view, I can think that he may be he may be inserting into the American political di political discussion 
uh, a form of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of working with one's enemy that will stay with us a long time. It'll serve as a model of something that is possible. It is possible for a human being in power to try to work with both sides. It looks crazy from this, from December 2010. It looks, it looks weak. It looks like he's selling out the, the <laughs> progressive position. But I just, I just wonder whether in the long run it won't have some ennobling effect. As, as the thing you were saying before about the fundamentalist, and maybe we don't realize now, but in the long run, maybe right, they will exactly. have to, yeah. But you, this is always true. The, the people that are reasonable are always at a disadvantage in arguing with the fanatics. The fanatics <laughs> don't have any capacity to be reasonable or to, to see the other person's side. That's the seeming power of fundamentalism. So when someone isn't out of the fundamentalist, when they are willing to say, well, maybe you do have a piece of the truth that looks weak in the short run, and, and maybe it is weak, and it, it certainly may prevent you from winning the argument, but there's something that's medicinal about it. Free will astrology. Free will astrology. Uh, you stress this free will part because in, a, in the classic uh, perception of astrology one of the major uh, counter arguments from people who were rational people like me i don't know it's that we we don't listen to the stars to decide what we do right. in, in, in the art what's your take i mean already your title is very telling free will right. astrology but can you explain briefly to us, what do you mean by that, by stressing free will? It's a very big subject that, uh, beyond the scope of this conversation um, in its entirety, but I will say that I think different people have more free will than other people. And what that means is that they are, are more or less free from some of their unconscious compulsions, from the conditioning they've absorbed from their family, from their religion, from the groups they've been a part of. Some people are more or less liberated from the, uh, the unconscious patterns that control other people. In that sense, the first group has more free will. And one of the advantages of studying astrology is to know what the cosmic tendencies are so as to take maximum advantage of them. Um, if if uh, Pluto is square Uranus, as, it, as it's going to be for the next few years, that in a person who's unconscious, that uh, could uh, lead them to, uh, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but if, if, if a person is just uh, held hostage by his own unconscious imprints, has no negotiation with his own shadow, is, is acting out of the ignorant programming that was inculcated into him throughout his upbringing, well, there's probably going to be more strife caused by that Uranus-Pluto uh, square. The person who is aware that there's a Uranus-Pluto square and what that what the potential of that very powerful configuration is, and says, well, I'm going to use this to, um, to build my stamina. I'm going to be aware that, um, uh, that uh, there's going to be tremendous uh, oppositional forces that, uh, that are going to be ripe for either conflict or conciliation that there is a tremendous amount of energy in this, in this configuration. I'm going to use it to, uh, with consciousness, with uh, an eye to uh, express it in its highest form, 
and not be held hostage by, oh, that makes me angry. I can't stand that. I'm just going to act in the rashest, most impulsive way. And in that sense, to know astrological configurations can contribute to uh, the exercise of liberation, of, of using one's will in a conscious way that serves the greater good. So, in, in a word, to, to simplify even more, it's a supplement of uh, knowledge yes. that can be sure. used by this person in order to uh, behave in, a, in the most sensible in the most sensible way. And he who does a study history is doomed to repeat it. And, and it's a similar principle. If you if you know what uh, has happened in similar situations, and uh, you're in a square of Pluto in the past. And you have some, you can study history to see what it's led to in the past. That may give you the ability to avoid the, the lower uh, expressions of it and to gravitate toward the higher expressions of it.